Professional Performance Magazine. I'm Dr. Jeff McGee. With us today is a very special guest, mentor of mine, colleague, although I probably shouldn't use those words, uh, an advisor and a major advocate of both Performance Magazine and myself for decades, the great Harvey McKay. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. How are you doing today? <laughs> Eight plus, around one to 10, a 12. I love it. So, so here's what I want to do today. You know, we we have some prepared questions for for everyone today, but also Harvey's been you know a regular contributor to our performance magazine. So, whatever we don't talk about today, here's the good news: you can read it in the magazine. We're gonna go deep and ask uh, Harvey to give us all of his pearls and wisdom, but we're gonna do this different today. You know, one of the things I've recognized, and over the years, Harvey, you've been very gracious and. You've introduced me to some phenomenal personalities out there as well in business and leadership and motivation, inspiration, success. But instead of talking about just, you know, how to motivate someone, I want to slide that to the side and, and really have a conversation that I think is much more powerful. And that is from, from the lens of getting to know you more effectively, I think will give all of us greater insight on what success is. And that's kind of what the questions were I put together. Does that sound fair? Sounds fair to me. Let, let me ask you, we're not live to an audience, are we? We are live to the universe of you and I only right now, correct? <laughs> I'll make, we're, I'll we're make sure. We're okay. going to go up on a podcast. Sound like, sound like you're speaking to an audience. I want to make sure. Okay. No, it's it's going to go up on our uh, station network, yes. It's going to go up as a podcast, yes. But we're also going to take this conversation and memorialize it into a phenomenal piece in our next issue of our magazine. So we're going to put it in multiple uh, uh, places. And with the answers, is it okay to to uh, to what I scribbled on on paper? Okay to go to those answers? Absolutely, absolutely. I didn't, want to, I didn't, I didn't want to miss a word. All right. I love you. This is good. So okay. First question, then right out of the gate. You know, it's, it's not about physical fitness. You know, people talk about that, so I don't want to dismiss it and say it's not important, but but mentally is where I want to go. I mean, you have been at, at the front of business and leadership and motivation and the self-help industry for decades. So, you know, question one is how do you mentally stay relevant yourself, Harvey? How do you stay cutting edge? Well, I've given, given that a lot of thought, and frankly, uh, uh, I just want to salute and applaud, first of all, the substance and the in-depth questions. They are <laughs> they are unique and they are different. Thank so, you, sir. So that's very, very interesting. Well, all my life I've I've been inquisitive. And I always want to know everything that's going on in my network. I even joke to some of my friends that I've already written my epitaph on my tombstone. And it's very brief. He couldn't sleep fast enough. I love it. I love it. That is great. It tells people this is, coming this is from. really true. No, no exaggeration. I, I've hated to go to sleep uh, because, you know, I'm afraid you know, that I'd miss something. Always wanted to know all my life what is going on out there. So that was very, very important. And the opportunity I've had every single day to, to monitor the news is extremely important. Uh, uh, you know, New York Times. Wall Street Journal, uh, uh, local newspapers, NBC, CBS, ABC, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, name them all. Uh, I do monitor all those stations. And you can't be relevant to, I'm sorry, pardon me, but, but uh, there's no substitute, again, for being curious then. And so the future belongs to the curious. I like and I can tell you, every single day, I monitor all those stations, believe it or not. The ones who are not afraid to try it and explore it, kind of poke it around a little bit, uh, rough it up, question it, turn it inside and out. You know, great thinkers, they definitely have curiosity. It's essential. Yeah, that really kind of flows right into question too. And that is, that, you know, again, from your elder statesman, with all due respect, but you're still an active business professional. Uh, you know, what are some of those traits that people need to possess to be relevant today and be relevant tomorrow? We've got a lot of people out there looking for shortcuts to all those successes, but what, what do you need to possess to be relevant? Well, number one, too many people want to start at the top and work up. Yeah. Instant gratification. Hey, you can't be relevant 
without having very knowledgeable resources at your disposal. I've gone out of my way my entire life to have top consultants economically, politically, massive number of CEOs from a, an array of different industries. Also, there are phenomenal podcasts, as you know, available to keep you up to speed on whatever topic that you want to learn more about. And don't forget about the TED Talks. There's so much information available today, and it's, as you know, right at your fingertips. That is what's amazing. If you go back decades ago, the couple of questions, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later, you know, do go back to the 80s and 90s. It, it, you had to work to find information in those days. Today, you're right. Everything is just absolutely right at your fingertips. You know, when you talk about CEOs right there, some of the people you surround yourself with them to ensure you're relevant, again, that flows perfectly into question three. I mean, you have been, you know, cutting edge for some of our uh, you know, subscribers to the magazine or or viewers of this 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 program, they're not familiar with with Harvey McKay. First, I'd say that needs to be your homework assignment. But given that, so we'll tease the audience with what they don't know. But again, you know, leading as as a as a major metro um, personality, both from you know university there in Minneapolis and Minnesota, the professional football team of the Vikings, you know, McKay envelope, which we'll talk about a little bit later. You know, you know, when you think about it from those perspectives in your business, you know, the book you read, how do you go about building loyalty? You had a strong nucleus of people have been around you in all those different areas for decades. How do you go about building loyalty today with what you see going on in the world and with business? Well, I've got that right at the top of my hiring list, uh, right at the very, very top. And I've never changed that, uh, basically, uh, since my father became my mentor at a, at a very early age. But hey, you, you can't demand loyalty, of course, unless you first give it. And you got to show it outwardly. In my personal hiring, again, I cannot exaggerate. I cannot emphasize. Without loyalty, you don't have anything. Uh, Lou Holtz is my close, close personal friend, Notre Dame coach, Hall of Famer. Uh, many of our listeners will have heard of him before. Uh, you know, we're joined at the hip, spent 40 years with him. We talk every other day for 40 years. And if you, if you were with us right this minute, and one of the greatest college football coaches that ever lived, boom, wind up a Lou Holtz doll, doll and he'll holler, loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. And so will almost every other coach that I've been in touch with. So that's very important. And then one of the first qualities I look for in the employees and my friends, of course, is the same thing, loyalty. Uh, someone can be a great worker, but if he or she isn't loyal, then what does their employment mean? It means nothing. Puts the company at risk in jeopardy. A yeah, friend, let's, let's a talk friend is me. only an acquaintance, just an acquaintance without loyalty. And when someone is my friend, guess what? <laughs> I, I make it 100% commitment that I'm all in and I expect the same. So so what are some of the ways, this may sound trite, but again, I agree with what you're talking about. How, how does a person, how does a person either build loyalty? What are those acts? What, what are those ways that you look for? Someone does this, I know they're loyal to me and I'm going to reciprocate and be loyal to them. What are those, as, as trite and simplistic as it may sound, I'm finding people are not, not as bright sometimes as I've realized. How do you build loyalty? Well, first of all, you have to recognize, as I already said, how important it is. And then I said, yes, also show it. And show it means, uh, I love this uh, phrase from Ken Blanchard. He's been a guest in your magazine for, uh, I, don't, I don't know how many years, decades. Yes, sir. And Blanchard is, again, a close personal friend. I wrote the introduction for me, Swim with the Sharks. I've written one of his key introductions. But he's got he's got one way of that I just love the quote. And that is, he says, go out and walk your plant every day. And then in front of mother, God, and country, catch someone doing something right. Okay. And then praise him or her. So you have to show those acts of loyalty, not only to that person one-on-one, -on -one, but also, it doesn't hurt in front of other people. I always try to praise someone 
okay, in front of someone else. And, and when I'm talking about loyalty, you've just- That's huge, that's huge. You, you, I mean, and, and that's, again, that's also part of one of the themes of our magazine. I learned, you know, decades ago when I started is again, you know, what are those acts? What are those behaviors? What are those key performance indicators? You know, you're a veteran, you know, it's easy to say, but, but, but it's not fair to say, because I know you're always a student of becoming better yourself, but, you know, older people, they may know how, how to, how to get to those success destinations. Younger people coming up, again, if we're not seeing it, therefore we don't know how to model it. We're not being taught it. If we're not reading it, you know, it's like we say, you need to give and give loyalty, or you need to be dedicated, or you need to have good work ethic. It just, it, 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 it boggles my mind today with some people, they don't get what to me is the obvious that's why I love this conversation. It's exactly why we're having this conversation to get inside the mindset of that. And you know, Let me so it a different way. I've never met a successful person that hasn't had to overcome a little or a lot of adversity in his or her life. And when that happens, and when you're working with those people, all right, that's when those problems come up. You have to have their back. You have to show loyalty. You have to show them that you trust them in the beginning and you're willing to go with them and gamble with them and move mountains for them. So they came up with some problems. So what? We'll solve it. So there's a myriad of, ways, of reasons and ways to show loyalty, but those are a couple. I love it. You know, let's back up a little bit. And, and again, part of the public's understanding and business people's understanding of you uh, is it, it, really is McKay Envelope. So re-educate us on how how that business came to be, how you moved it to become such a industry force. Walk us through a little bit of that history. Sure. Uh, who wouldn't like to talk about <laughs> their company? All right. I'm proud of a lot of things. Number one is when I said I do 63 years ago, but right there at the top, uh, also becoming an entrepreneur and putting all those people to work, many, many, many hundreds of them over many years, decades. So in a prioritized order, uh, I was thinking about this, uh, how I built McKay Envelope Company, which today we call McKay Mitchell Envelope Company. I formed immediately a seven person kitchen cabinet to be my advisors and made sure that they would never tell Harvey what he wanted to hear, but rather the straight scoop. I went out and found two mentors, one young and one seasoned old grizzly who promised me access whenever I needed it. I used my network to call everyone in the country who was tied to the envelope industry, looking for advice and counsel. That's not easy to find. Because I started on my own, I had a philosophy to make as much money as fast as I could. I know this is a little strange, but when you're on your own, sometimes you have to do that. I accomplished this by putting all my emphasis on sales. Sales makes up, Jeff, for a lot of mistakes. Absolutely. Nothing happens until you bring the business through the front door. I build a powerful sales force, a terrific sales force. It not only gets you the business, but hey, they'll get you the profitable business rather than what I call contributions to overhead. This, what we're looking for, look what that salesperson can do. On top of it, he or she can bring you delivery time. If I gave our whole sales force five-day delivery when the industry is three to four weeks, anybody can sell anything. It takes no talent. But in the meantime, <laughs> there goes the use of our machines, you know, expeditiously. And so you can't do that. So today I'm proud to say that we're, one of the leading envelope manufacturing companies uh, in the past 50 years. Amazing. So, so from, from, from that tenure, you know, when you were building and, and really kind of getting into a good pace with the envelope company, tell me where in there did, did, did the book that really opened the door and a lot of people watching may not realize this, but, but your book really, was one of the major forces. There might be two other authors you know of, two other speakers you know of, but you know that 1980s and 90s had a swim with a shark without being eaten alive. 
that opened the door for people to start thinking about what are the other books out there or or individuals that I want to you know connect with, follow, study, bring in to speak in my organization or in my large conventions. So tell me how that book came to be and and, and how did that change your trajectory? <laughs> it surely changed, that's for sure. Well, Swim of the Sharks was 100% unadulterated good luck. People go around all their lives and say, hey, what should I buy? What should I sell? That's the wrong question. When should I buy? And when should I sell? Timing is everything. And believe me, my timing in accidentally meeting Larry King changed my career. I had written Swim with the Sharks, and my publisher sent me over to an advertising agency the very first week to cut a commercial for my book. And lo and behold, ironically, Larry King was also there doing the same thing. He offered me a ride back to my hotel. It was only a short 10 minute ride in his stretch limo. In other words, I had 10 minutes to get on Larry King, live show, number one talk show on the planet. There's your shark tank of the day. And I call this High Soprano. Awesome. So I learned from my father that when you meet a celebrity, people usually do about three things. They do one of these three things. They tell the celebrity how good he or she is. They fawn over the celebrity. Tell them how good they are. Okay? They also play the do you know game. Uh-uh. I had prepared to win my entire life through my father. <laughs> And I eliminated those three immediately. I was prepared to approach the short ride totally different. My brain bank said to me, ask Larry, what can I do for him to help him sell books? I had meticulously studied the publishing industry for the past two years. So during the ride, I gave Larry several, several substantive, in-depth ideas how to creatively sell books that he had never heard of before. When we arrived at the hotel, Larry shocked me. I mean, shocked me by asking me to come on his program that same week and share these ideas. Whew. He kept me on the show for the entire hour, and I sold 50,000 hardcover books the first week virtually overnight. And that, that is huge, Harvey, not only today, but again, put it into context. What year are we talking? We're talking, talking 35 years ago. That that number 35 years ago is a game changer in the industry. We're not talking a bestseller overnight and all the crap people today talk about. I got a bestseller because you sold two books on Amazon at 3 a.m. We're talking real sales of real books uh, when people had to buy them and, and people primarily went into bookstores to buy them. Yeah, this is huge. Keep going. I just want to in insert that. This is amazing. And then Oprah Winfrey calls the next day. All right. Good Morning America calls. The Today Show call. And many, many others contacted my publisher for me to come on their program. And, of course, the rest is history. I wouldn't be doing this interview if it weren't for Larry King. I went on the right seven New York Times bestselling books, three that has hit number one, which I'm very proud of. And of course, uh, uh, talk to me, uh, oh, I sold incidentally 10 million books then uh, to date and uh, have been translated into 52 languages, uh, distributed in 80 countries. And when you talk about Swim with the Sharks, the New York Times named the 15 best uh, 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 um, performance books sales books, creative selling books, okay, uh, motivational books, top 15 in the last 100 years, and I was on that list. It's amazing. I, I mean, I appreciate it again, as I said at the top of this program. I mean, you've been very gracious to me. You talk about Larry King. I mean, you know, I had a chance to interview him for my magazine as well. My experience, again, very giving, very gracious gentleman. You talk about Lou Holtz. You introduced you know him to us many years ago. We've done cover feature interviews with him. We're going to do a program just like this with him 
uh, in the next couple of weeks, again, where I'm, where I'm hitting pause and saying, okay, I want to talk to these greats around us. Um, not about, again, how to motivate, how to stay excited. Those are the easy questions. I started realizing everyone's asking the same questions. I want, I want to hit pause and make sure we're talking to, you know, greats like you and getting inside your mindset of, of exactly what you're sharing here. How did you, how did you get to where you are? And what I'm fascinated, you've now said this several times that, that it is luck. But again, a little bit, you're being humble. I mean, you had your act together. You knew what you were doing. So you're ready for that opportunity. But what you're also saying is that sometimes you just you just have to bust your butt to get to where you want to go. It doesn't just happen. Well, I, I strongly believe that, again, that our lives basically change in three ways. The people we meet, the books and magazines we read, and where we travel. People think that mentors, you know, also must be in person. Uh, and that's not necessarily true at all. Nothing could be further from the truth. I've used your magazine over the years, believe it or not, okay, to have my favorite authors be my mentors, okay, by studying their work. And what a gold mine. I mean, John Maxwell, uh, Brendan Burchard, uh, Stephen Covey, Nito Cubain, uh, uh, Jeffrey Gittimore, Susie Orman, Zig Ziglar, uh, Jim Rohn. I could go on and on and on. I mean, John Maxwell, just, just imagine this. He's trained 50,000 executives in the last five years in every country in the world. Amazing. How's that for a mentor? Yeah. You got phenomenal people in your brain bank, as you said. And, and again, many of those have been people that have great star covers and have written and shared freely. You know, yep. with our readers over the over the years. So you're exactly so, right. I thank you so much. So people have to know that our listeners out there, the mentor is really urgent and important over a lifetime. But you can do it through magazines and you can do it, do it through books also. I always have thought about that. And that's what I do. It's absolutely huge. You know, as, as you kind of you know look forward now at the windshield of the future and kind of look at you know individuals. We may have touched on this before, so I don't want to be redundant. But if there's something else in the head, you know, just for professionals to be successful in the future and be relevant, I keep using that word relevant. Uh, what what traits do do we need to possess? What traits do we need to make sure we're going out and growing and developing so we have that in our skill set box? Well, there's a million words in the English language. All right. And without this one, sorry, you don't have a chance. And that word is integrity. If you have integrity, nothing else matters. If you don't have integrity, nothing else matters. So That's you can't, right there. can't be in business without that. Then I look for uh, three things, uh, because I just said earlier that you have to bring the business, have someone bring the business through the front door. Nothing happens until someone brings it through the front door. But I look for three things. If I'm interviewing you, and I'm interviewing, you know, 10 other uh, potential salespeople, key markets have to have the best of the best. On the one to 10, I'm looking for 12. I want, number one, a hungry fighter. Number two, I want a hungry fighter. Number three, I want a hungry fighter. And then people skills. Of course, I'm a proud Dale Carnegie graduate, as well as some of us. Are you two? Absolutely, all three of them. Uh, you see, great minds run together. I'm, I'm just trying to run to catch up to you. That's all. That's all I'm trying to do, Harvey. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what happens when you catch up with the Joneses? Should I tell you what happens? Tell they, me. They refinance. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't want to keep that much up with them. I'll let them refinance because that means they just slid right behind me. Okay, so continue on that very important topic, though, networking. And, you know, it's impossible to be successful today. And the, I call it dog-eat-dog, rat-eat-rat, shark-eat-shark world without being a top networker. And remember, your network is your net worth. Don't ever forget that. Creative. Creative. You, you have to be a differentiator in business. Creativity will set you apart from your competitors. We work on that every single day. You must start every day with a healthy dose 
of vitamin C creativity. And continuous improvement, you don't go to school once for a lifetime. You're in school all of your life. You must believe and practice the following. The biggest room in the world is the room for improvement. And I want to repeat that. It just it just absolutely amazes me, Harvey. Right. Say that again. The biggest room in the world is the room for improvement. So Those are the kinds of persons I want on my payroll. And then lastly, I do have a fanatical attention to detail. Little things mean a lot. <laughs> Not true. Little things mean everything. Well, I've been a student of that that mindset for many years. And you're right. When you're at the receiving end as a customer, that's one mindset. But when you're at the receiving end as a customer and a business owner, an entrepreneur, I think you just see a little bit differently. You understand a sense of urgency doesn't mean panic and crisis. A sense of the details don't mean a lot. You're right. They mean everything. You know, I, I, again, a phrasing that when someone will, 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 will omit doing the easy things, when someone doesn't want to do their minimum, you know, then the mindset has to go to what else are they missing? What else are they not doing? Um, and I think that that's one of the elements, you know, coming out of COVID was, you know, kind of what I refer to, you know, when I would speak on stages or work with my clients, COVID too was the great global reboot. It kind of pushed everyone back to a reset if you were smart and quick. But it's amazing how people coming out of COVID um, really have lowered their performance bar, whether they realize it or not. And they think that that's, that's absolutely enough and fine. It's crazy. I agree 100%. It's, it's crazy. Uh, let, let's let's uh, let's play a little bit deeper here for a minute. Yeah, and, and I and I struggle with a with a with a better way to ask this question than to just ask. You know, how do you think? What 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 influences how you think? You know, get us inside that mindset. You don't have a chance to have that kitchen, you know, table cabinet advising you or etc. How does how does Harvey McKay think? What drives how you think? Well, when I make a speech, which has been one a week for about 40 years, <laughs> got a few miles uh, at 30,000 feet, but I'll always say in that talk I'm delivering, this is it. This is numero uno, head and shoulders above the rest. So uh, so in, in these, re there's so many good questions here, but if I if you just nailed me down to two or three or four, this would be right there. I mean, smack dab, uh, spot on. So over my lifetime, uh, I've had numerous professional coaches help me develop whatever natural talent that I may have. I understand that I'll never be as good as some of those coaches that I've hired, but I can surely improve, okay, without question on my limited abilities. So I go to people who know what they're doing. I've hired professional coaches for public speaking, writing, ideas, creativity, memory, foreign languages, running marathons, golf, tennis, water skiing, downhill skiing, swimming, dancing, thanks to my wife, bowling, <laughs> boxing, scuba diving, ice skating, basketball, and many others. I'm not spending a single penny, but I'm making an investment in myself. And believe me, it comes back tenfold. I cannot exaggerate those comments. You know, it, it is interesting how many people don't, and you've touched on it in several comments you've made, that again, you know, you are your own greatest asset. And how are you leveraging your talents and skills? How are you surrounding yourself with people that can help you to see how to be bigger and better, play bigger, you know, how you continuously developing yourself. It is amazing how many people don't understand that, you know, it, it, it's a continuous journey and you're always looking at your skill sets and how do I improve or who do I associate with? It'll make me bigger and better than who I was. And it, I think it's alarming. Sometimes people put themselves in a box and they start limiting themselves or we put people in boxes and we limit them and think, well, these are the people that get, go on and get more education and these don't. I think that's a, that's a huge misread. Um, and, and you've spoken to a lot of the great questions that you know we wanted to visit with today. Inspiration. Though, talk to me about what inspires you, and and, and you know how does inspiration play a value tool in in the professional uh, of today and tomorrow? 
in inspiration? Well, let's analyze that one. Every day you get up in the morning, guess what? You've got two choices. You can be optimistic or you can be pessimistic. And of course, I am an eternal optimist, as you well know. <laughs> Where there is an optimist, there really truly is a way. Success requires really irrepressible pest, uh, optimism. I'll take optimism over pessimism every single day of my life. I've discovered that it's just as easy to look for the good things. You have to look for the good things in life as they as they come, not the bad. If you look at the bright side of life, look what happens. You'll know that you'll never develop eye strain. All right, so in other words, thinking positive, it has no negative. When I'm hiring again, especially for sales, obviously, I'm looking for optimists. I have no negative friends. People just don't want to go around with negative friends. And everybody out there listening should be thinking right now, do I have you know, negative friends. So some of the other qualities include being a self-starter, of course, maintaining focus, enthusiasm, and trust. That's a must and the most important five-letter word among those million words in the English language. T-R-U-S-T, -S trust. Powerful. Goes with your, goes with brother and sister integrity. Yep. Absolutely huge. You know, recently Gallup did a did a huge research model. It came out right before COVID hit us. I know COVID's, you know, several years ago, but it still hangs in the psychology of, of people around the globe. But Gallup had a research model that I find you know, working with associations and businesses a little bit concerning. I'd love to get your perspective on it. And it really basically said about 50, 60 percent of people who were surveyed, you know, self-reported back as being disengaged and complacent in the workplace why does it appear, or is it a false perception? Why does it appear so many people are disengaged, complacent, going through, what's the minimum I can do or need to do? You know, what, what's the cause of that? How do we, how do we, uh, you know, deal with that head on? What are your thoughts? Well, I believe that, and I accept that survey. I don't know which survey you're referring to, but uh, there, there's a lot of pollers out there, as you well know. And, and uh, I do agree uh, with those results that they've found. You'll never be able to help people reach their potential. I mean, never, if you haven't taken the time to have a deep down burning desire and understanding with and about that individual. And this is kind of my secret sauce. So those top four I'm talking about, uh, this quote. Right again. I'll, you're my teacher today. Notice I'm not just asking, I'm taking notes. <laughs> well, pale ink, this is very important. Pale ink is better than the most retentive memory, which means write it down, right? So uh, back when I was 21 years old, I developed the 66-question customer profile, and I call it the McKay 66. And I've been Boss, that is huge for our visitors and listeners and readers. I mean, that was that was actually not a norm concept back decades ago. No, that, that changed how a lot of business leaders did strategic planning and business planning. It changed how professional sales uh, individuals looked at the strategic side of their accounts and an individual. Um, it's worked its way into software systems today. I bet you, you know, some of the largest, uh, you know, Salesforce or Infusionsoft or SAS, I and mean, all of these different platforms probably have hijacked your concept. This is huge. Yep. So keep going, but I wanted to context it. This is it. Well, my Salesforce went ballistic when they see that I wrote about this and swim with the sharks. Uh, I've been preaching about the power of the McKay 66 my entire career. Okay, it's a tool to help you, and here's the key buzzwords. Humanize your selling strategy, repeat. Humanize your selling strategy. Studies show that you can't talk business all the time. Your customers, of course, are people first. So at McKay Mitchell, Mitchell okay, all right? We require all of our salespeople to fill out this McKay 66 about their customers. You wouldn't believe how much we know about our customers. IRS wouldn't believe how much right. we know about our customers. Brilliant. 
And the McKay 66 is available for free on my website, just harveymckay.com. Just that simple. Everyone needs to go get this. When, when I first was introduced to this decades ago, um, I had become the youngest sales instructor in the world teaching Dale Carnegie sales class at age 24. And I thought I was pretty damn sharp. And then you smacked me back down to the ground with your 66. I realized, wow, how much I don't know. And sometimes you need a little bit of, you know, humbling, uh, put you in your place. This is huge. And again, I would encourage anyone, even if you're not in sales, download this from Harvey's website and then and then internalize it. Like what you said, humanize it to whatever your business is. I mean, if you're not in sales, but you deal with human beings as a portion of what you do in your career, this will give you a way to start to recognize how much I don't know about the people on my team. Um, thank you for sharing that. Absolutely powerful. Yeah, the last 35 years, I've given away hundreds of thousands of them. Happy, happy to do it. And everybody that gets it makes copies and sends it to other people. And when I'm talking about the 66, I'm not talking about their taste in envelopes. <laughs> I'm going to based on routine conversation and observation. What are the customers like as human beings? What they feel strongly about? What they are most proud of having achieved? any status symbols in his or her offices. In other words, we want to know what turns that human being on. And remember, this is not just for our customers. It's also for our suppliers. You see, we want the best paper suppliers in the country. We want the best ink suppliers. There's no difference between a customer at McKay Mitchell Envelope Company and a supplier. They're just as important. Everyone in your ecosystem. Use the McKay 66 for employees also and competitors, anyone whom you can benefit from knowing more about. So each time you encounter those persons, you learn a little bit more about them and you keep building that 66 list. You'll probably never fill, fill out all 66 items, but 30 are better than 20 and 15 answers are better than 10. So Absolutely. practice the above, and you can't help but becoming an outstanding leader also. Absolutely love it. You know, you, you talk about ways to, to, to connect with someone on a genuine level and on a deeper level. And by getting to know them, you build your relationships. And from that, you start to understand what someone else's needs are, what, what their wins and what their failures are, what their pain points are. Uh, and how to serve them. And you start to then have that relationship where it's almost like your kitchen cabinet metaphor. Now, you know, the more I know about you as my client or you, my vendor, partner, supplier, part of my subconscious brain is always thinking about you. And I see an idea of how to help you genuinely. And I share that. I mean, I don't, I'm not looking for anything back. I think that's what also shows integrity and trust in that relationship and some of the key other concepts and comments you've made so far with this today. This is, this is imperative. Powerful, excuse me. My stuttering is kicking in. So, <laughs> so, so let me ask, you know, the, the word that a lot of people talk about in business, and some people kind of take the angle that that they they see this as a non-play, and others they see it as a major play. But talk to me about how passion plays into uh, you know uh, to resilience and business and success and goals and just in life, or or does passion have nothing to do with it? Well, yeah, and, and there's there's 15 synonyms, you know, for, for the passion and the inspiration. Uh, I, I have an extraordinarily uh, unbelievable five years living with my father after I lost my mother to breast cancer at age 49. And the life lessons that I learned from my father, Jack McKay, helped me tremendously in launching my business and my family. For example, he taught me, you want to have a happy marriage and raise outstanding, just down to earth kids? You must be happily married first. Secondly, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. Make sure you give them every opportunity to further their education. My father used to tell me you can spend your entire lifetime building a good name and reputation and one foolish act can destroy it all. Nowhere is there more truth than in building a successful business if you don't have a positive reputation. It will be difficult to be successful. Reputation 
is one of the few assets that your competition, they cannot undersell, okay, or destroy it. You can't put a price on a good reputation. Absolutely. You buy a good reputation. My father had an Associated Press in St. Paul for 35 years, and he had a brilliant career. This would have been impossible if not, if he had not mastered the art of networking, okay, which was just, of course, so very, very important. This had a dramatic effect on me as I became a professional speaker over a period of 50 plus years and have had the opportunity to speak on six continents. The definition of a secret is when one person knows, wow, did my father ever change my life when he shared the secret with me. He pulled me aside, age 21, and he told me that one quarter of my life should be devoted to volunteerism. Volunteerism. Little did I know how much this would considerably change my life over a lifetime. I've served over 20 boards, served on over 20 boards of directors and trustees, as well as serving as president of the University of Minnesota National Alumni Association, the Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce, Minnesota Chamber of Cancer, uh, uh, Cancer Society, and that's just to name a few. So that's my feeling about what my father did for me. And boy, what a network does that volunteerism, just think about that. That one line puts you in that trajectory. Look, look at all that volunteering and look at all that networking that you're sitting in on, on closed door meetings. Is that wild? That's amazing. Truly really amazing. Yeah, I really appreciate your time today as we kind of come up on the time commitments that I, uh, I asked when I promised. You know, two more quick questions. One, when you're interacting with other, you know, business professionals or political professionals or celebrities or athletes, you know, the people that are in your orbit, when you guys get together and have serious, meaningful conversations, what are you all talking about? What what What's on your minds? When I'm together with all those people? Yeah. Well, of course, first of all, I'm only going around with winners, right? <laughs> I'm only going around with successful people. And, and there's no quite, and of course, in today's society, I mean, how can you overlook it? But wherever you go, wherever you gather, uh, other than with your own family, can't talk about politics, can't talk about the world. But with <laughs> other people, you can certainly share ideas. If you're doing all the talking, guess what? You can't learn anything. There you go. That's my inquisitive mind that goes to all those people. And because I'm inquisitive, I give it some thought. Example, every time I call up uh, celebrities, you know, that's part of my life. I'm sorry. I'm interviewing those people all the time. And so if it's a Larry King, if it's a Lou Holtz, doesn't matter who it is, uh, what do I do? Well, I do the same thing before I go to a meeting as I do before I pick up the phone. And before I pick up the phone, what do I do? Got a piece of paper, pale ink again, repeat, better than the most retentive memory. And I write down interesting things I want to find out from the four or five or six people that I'm having lunch with who are yeah. talented people so I can absolutely be productive. All right. And if you really, if you really study another person's life and their successes again, the Asking good questions. I'm just slipping away now a little bit from your, this question, but asking good questions is so relevant, so 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 important. I I I just can't begin to tell you how, how how important that is. So asking good questions is important, and therefore I'll do that. I'll have that on paper, and I'll before I go to the meeting, and I'll memorize what I want to talk to them about. And I'll learn. And then what do you think happens after the meeting? When I come back to my car, guess what? I don't start my car. Reflect, no. digest. 50% of what we hear, okay, in the following 45 minutes to an hour, we forget. 50%. They'll ink again. So I always do that when I come back from a party, when I hang up on a telephone conversation, come back from lunch, I don't start my car. I start writing again. Oh, yeah. and, and so those are some of the things I do with those important people that you're talking about. That's awesome. I love that. Let's let's finish on values. You know, what what's your take on 
you know, how do how do our va- you know, how do we shape the right values in people ourselves? How do values you know kind of guide our own actions and thoughts? Um, and are some of the problems we're seeing as we look out over the horizon in society are they connected to a, a, a lack of values? Tell me what your views are about values. Well, how are you gonna how are you gonna be successful? How are you gonna live? How are you going to have goals? And this is important, a goal, and I'm going to repeat this. A goal is a dream with a deadline. Measurable, identifiable, attainable, specific, in writing. How are you going to have values, okay, without having some goals that are in writing, both short-term and long-term? And without values, you could, I mean, I don't know about our listeners, But I can tell you, it doesn't take me long uh, to find out from almost everybody I meet, what do they stand for? You know, what do they believe in? What do they practice? You know, and I find out that's because of the 66, of course. I'm asking questions all the time. And question number in the 66, of course, is what do they believe in? You know, and are they religious? And do they have values? Those, Those are all questions that you try to get from that 66. So when it comes down to those top four, you know, now I guess those top four might be the top 66. <laughs> they're, they're all so relevant. Uh, they, they, they really are truly important. So therefore, uh, relationships, how can you have a relationship with anyone if you don't share their values or you don't share them you can respect their values, all right? So that's the way I live my life every single day. And of course, uh, uh, one last thing I'd like to say, if you said, Harvey, or anything else you want to say, um, I guess this would be the, uh, this would be some more sauce, okay? <laughs> but, but I mentioned it a little, I referred to it a little bit, but but again, it's my, it's, it's my whole life. If I meet you, uh, uh, Jeff, um, on an airplane, you know, at a, at a symphony ball, doesn't matter where, okay? At a business meeting, my hand goes out, your hand goes out, boom! Again, right to my brain bank, what can I do for Jeffrey? How can I add value to his life? And I really get up every single day, and I have been doing that all of my life. And I would just plead with any of the listeners that ever hear this interview or read this interview, just take a month out of your life and try to do that when you get up. What can I do for the people that I'm going to meet today? How can I help them? How can I add value to their life? And when you do that, okay, your whole life changes. It really does. All of a sudden, worrying becomes this. You know, whatever you're worrying about, you kind of say to yourself, who cares? All right. And and that's what I say every day when I get up in the morning. You know, who am I going to be in, in touch with? Who am I going to be talking to? Can I add value to their life? And I really go then and promise and guarantee those people when I mean it, I say it. Lou Holtz, meet him anywhere in the world. When he says goodbye, I guarantee you in blood, he'll look you right in the eye and say, if I can ever be of any help to you, you call me. But he means it. He means it. It, it is amazing. That's, Absolutely that's right. Counts. That servant heart, servant mind, servant spirit. Uh, yes. I've heard from you and others. And that's that's part of my signature line on my email. Whenever I send an email, the last sentence is always there. It's easier to delete it when it's not appropriate than to remember it or to hold yourself accountable. It always is. Let me know how I can serve you next. Because that's, that's what it's about, end of the day. So... You, you live you live what you teach you uh you have in my life shared with me and lived what your brand and persona is and uh for that i'm forever grateful i greatly appreciate harvey all you've done for others uh that have failed to say thank you but i definitely wanted to say thank you for taking time to to sit down with us and just talk through you know what what the landscape of your past has been that we all can learn from in terms of your future and mine as well so thank you so much i appreciate it well, Jeffrey, I couldn't be more sincere when I when I say this, and and they don't pay off on effort. 
they pay off on results. And, and seriously, you know how to deliver results with that publication. And thank I you. thank you very much for it. And of course, if most of the readers are like me, all right, how can you how can you read something in those articles, then practice it in the marketplace? All right, I love to say, all right, that ideas without action are worthless. Okay, and knowledge doesn't become power until it's used. Yeah, how can you can't believe that? So then you use it in the marketplace, but guess what? I have to think of you all the time. So I am thinking about you because where did I read it? I read it in your publication. You're too kind. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye, sir. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Thank you.